ตาเลนเกซามาลอลายาซัมเดติสติเลจินชวียินตาเลนเกเลนเจซันรอนนังเกเลเจนดีนังเนตุงเนชุซอกซุมตาวะจุงยีเซทุงยินพิมิดิ
elected members of parliament <clears throat> have very little knowledge about Tibet, apart from those who are directly associated with us. Therefore, it's very important that we create more awareness on what China is doing, not only to Tibet, but also to the region, countries in the region, and internationally. So we have been traveling as much as possible. Last month, I was in Brazil, in Colombia, Mexico, United States. This month, I was in Canada, Spain, Austria, and France. And we have also visited many other countries to spread awareness about Tibet. Unfortunately, not many understand China as they should. That is why I keep telling them, it's not just that I'm, I come here to seek support for Tibet, but it's for your own country's future. It's for your own people that you need to understand China. It's not enough just to have investment from China and be happy, happy about it. China's, there's nothing called free lunch for China. Unfortunately, despite the rhetorics from many countries, business is going up with China. And the only thing that can bring China down on its knees is economy. Right now, China is having a lot of problems on the economic front and also on the political front, even though the system is very opaque. There are a lot of things that we can talk about, the geostrategic importance of Tibet, the historical independent status of Tibet, and the role that Tibet plays as a political buffer between the two most populous nations in this world, India and China. Till China's occupation of Tibet in 1950, there was never ever a border between China and India. There was never ever a war between India and China. Only after China occupied Tibet, it became Indochina border. But I take solace in the fact that the Indian government has not changed the name from Indo-Tibetan Border Force, Indo-Tibetan Border Police, to Indochina Border Police. And I would urge the media also to use the same that the Indian government uses that underlines the thinking behind the Indian government's policies towards China. There are a lot of things that we can talk about in terms of the geostrategic importance of Tibet, its location, the size of Tibet, at one time, a Pakistani journalist asked me, which is bigger, Bhutan or Tibet? It's multiple times. It's, Tibet is 10 times the size of UK, 18 times the size of Japan, about 60-70% of India's landmass, 25% of China's landmass. So the size of Tibet itself had played a role as a political buffer between the two most populous nations. And in future, if there is a negotiated solution with China, Tibet and Tibetans can play the role of a bridge between the two most populous nations in the world. We can help, also help in building trust between China and India. That is why His Holiness has adopted the middle way policy, <clears throat> a policy that's, that's based on pragmatism, that's based on the reality of the situation, where Chinese and Tibetans can mutually benefit from each other. A negotiated non-violent solution could be lasting. And that is what we are pushing for, despite the historical status of Tibet as an independent state. When I travel around the world, I also tell governments that if you keep repeating the statement just like a parrot, at the instance of the Chinese government that Tibet is part of PRC, you are going against the international law. <clears throat> was one, we have only one agreement with China, that's the 17-point agreement, the so-called 17-point agreement that was forced upon us after occupation of Chamdo and under international law that should be null and void. Whether it's happening to Ukraine today or whether it happened to Tibet more than 70 years ago, it's the same international law after the formation of United Nations. And we also tell governments that you keep repeating the statement that Tibet is part of PRC. But on the other hand, just maybe to appease it, His Holiness the Dalai Lama or the Tibetans, countries also say we support negotiation between the representative of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan and the Chinese leadership. <clears throat> but these two don't go together. If there is no recognition of the historical status of Tibet as an independent country, there is no liberation for middle way. There's no reason why China should come and talk to us. And when you keep repeating that statement, 
then you, you are removing the very ground for negotiations. And the third thing we tell the international community is that why is China asking other governments to say Tibet is part of PRC, not other regions like East Turkestan or Mongolia? Because the Chinese government knows that they have no legitimacy of their rule over Tibet. That is why they are trying to seek that legitimacy from the international community. But unfortunately, the international community does not understand Tibet's history but they keep parroting Tibet, uh, the China's uh, coercive uh, means of uh, accepting Tibet as part of China. And that is not fair, that is not justice for the Tibetan people. And there is also the environmental significance of Tibet. Tibetan rivers, the rivers that originate from Tibet flow into India and Pakistan in the form of Indus, which is the cradle of Indus Valley civilization, one of the oldest civilizations in this world. Yellow River originates from Tibet and flow into China. And Yellow River is the cradle of Chinese civilization. So rivers that originate from Tibet are homes to many civilizations. And some of them very old civilizations in this world. If it is not for Yellow and Yangtze, China would not be able to support its 1.4 billion people. Then you have the Mekong that flows from Tibet and into five different countries in Southeast Asia, Burma, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and Vietnam. Then you also have Irrawaddy and Salween that flows into Burma. You have the Brahmaputra that originates from Western Tibet, comes to Eastern Tibet, takes a U-turn to come into India and into Bangladesh. And China is building a dam twice the size of Three Gorges, which is the biggest in the world, to generate three times the electricity that Three Gorges Produces, and you can imagine how much land is going to be inundated upstream to store that much of water that will destroy so much flora and fauna that is very unique to Tibet. Last time I was in Arunachal Pradesh, and the Chief Minister Pema Khandula was very kind enough to send us a helicopter to travel by. And I was traveling from Mayo to Tuting, and the whole route of that helicopter was over the Brahmaputra and Brahmaputra was very murky. When you see from the helicopter, the tributaries that joined the Brahmaputra were pristine clean, pristine clear, and that's how Brahmaputra should be coming from inside Tibet, but it's very murky. And when I asked the locals, they said it's not just happening in the last two, three months or last, last one year. It has been happening since 2018, and that is proof enough of what Chinese government is doing at Pemakwe, the Great Bend, where they are building this massive mega structure. And the whole Himalayan region, as scientists say, is still growing by 10 millimeters every year because of the tectonic shift between the Gondwanas and the Eurasian plate. In that case, the whole Himalayan region is also prone to earthquakes, to seismic. It's a huge seismic zone. If something happens to the size of that kind of a dam inside Tibet, what is going to happen to people in Arunachal Pradesh, in Assam, and in Bangladesh, they are going to be washed away. There is going to be serious human catastrophe and destruction of properties, which we cannot imagine at this stage. So it should be a major concern to the government of India and to the people of India the, to take care of Tibet's environment. Smaller rivers like Karnali flow into Nepal. So you're talking about Tibetan rivers that flow into 10 different countries in the region. And the countries that we are talking about are some of the most densely populated areas in this world. Some people say the Third World War could happen because of water. In that sense, Tibet is a huge biospot. You are talking about serious water security. You are talking about serious food security in the region because China does not share any hydrological data with any of its downstream countries. But the downstream countries are not strong enough to rise up and tell that reality to the Chinese government, including India. I was here in Delhi as the director of Tibetan Parliamentary and Policy Research for seven and a half years between 2001 and 2008. And we, we organized the first water conference. There was very little awareness. Now we can see a little more awareness, but that is not enough. I think we have to rise up to the occasion and tell China for what they are doing to, 
Tibetan rivers, to the Tibetan water, to Tibet's ecology and environment. And then also there is the Tibetan Buddhist culture. Now in this world, ridden with violence, the message of Buddha is more relevant than ever before. And we Tibetans have preserved that religion and that message is manifested in the form of His Holiness teachings around the world as a messenger of India, uh, of Indian wisdom. Of course, today we are here to talk about Pension Rinpoche. The 10th Pension Rinpoche has played a very pivotal role. As Namjala mentioned, we consider the Dalai Lamas and Pension Lamas as a star, the sun and the moon of the sky. His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, had to flee Tibet in 1959. His Holiness was in India in 1956-57. Pension Rinpoche, the 10th Pension Rinpoche, also accompanied His Holiness in 56-57, visited on pilgrimage to many Buddhist sites in India. And when His Holiness came to India as an exile, as a refugee, as a political refugee, Pension Lama decided to stay back in Tibet. And he, was, he wrote a 70,000 character letter way back in 1962-63 to the Chinese leadership describing the, the, the bad situation that Tibet has turned into after China's occupation inside Tibet. And he was incarcerated. He was publicly denounced. He had to go through a lot of things, including incarceration for more than 10 years during the Cultural Revolution when everything old was being destroyed in the whole of China and more so in Tibet, where 6,000 monasteries were destroyed. 1.2 million Tibetans directly or indirectly died because of China's occupation. And lately, from 2009 till today, or till about last year, 157 Tibetans have self immolated And when we travel around the world, people ask us, why don't we hear about Tibet anymore? But who is paying attention to non-violence or non-violent movements? There's too much focus on violence. Look at Israel, Hamas. Look at Ukraine. And then you, it's more like we are promoting violence. People realize that only if you take up violence, the world pays attention. There is not enough attention on non-modern movements. We have been decrying about this. And the world international community also look up to India as a leader. Uh, the political, there is no space, political space inside Tibet. If you have read 1984 by George Orwell, it's more like George Orwell's 1984 has come into reality in the whole of China and more so in Tibet, where the state surveils and controls everything. Now the government collects DNA samples of people, iris scanning of people, electronic identification, geolocation, and they track every single thing what the Tibetans are doing. And the system is so gridlocked that even if I think about self-immolation today, I have to think 100 times before I burn myself. I could die, I could get scarred for life, but then all my immediate relatives are going to suffer because of my action. And that's how gridlocked the system is. And that is how there is no space for political activities inside Tibet. And that is why you don't hear much about Tibet these days. In terms of religious freedom, the number of monks and nuns have come down drastically. We were talking about 7,700 monks, 5,500 monks, 3,300 monks in the huge monasteries that we have in Tibet which we have been able to replicate in India with the leadership of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the religious leaders of all traditions. Now, the management of the monasteries and nuns have been taken over by the Chinese intelligence security forces and the United Foreign Work Department. The Chinese government, which is an atheist government, wants to be responsible for setting up curriculum for Buddhist studies and they say with Chinese characteristics. Nobody understands what that is. Some people change the design of the monasteries to say it's a Chinese characteristics. So Chinese laws and regulations are so ambiguous that they can interpret it in any manner they want, depending on how they see the other person. 
and the activities they are involved in. For monks and nuns to travel from one place to another, they need to take at least four or five different permits. Some of the monasteries that flourished in Eastern Tibet in the last several decades that has more than 10,000 monks have been dismantled. The monks and nuns have been pushed away to their native places, demonged, deroped, made to marry. And the biggest monasteries that we have in Tibet today only have only about 400, 500 monks. And if new novice monks want to join monasteries within the limited number they allow, you need at least four other people to guarantee that this monk will not undertake any political activity. And if the monk takes up a political activity, then the four monks are the four other people who guarantees for that monk ends up in jail. That is the level of suppression of religious freedom inside Tibet. And Chairman P. Nandila also referred to order number five that was introduced in 2007 by the Chinese government, which says that the Chinese government will be responsible for recognition of reincarnated lamas, or what they call as living Buddhas. And they have been maintaining a list of the lamas that they have recognized. Now, coming back to Pension Ramuche, you know, he has played a very important role in his previous life as the 10th Pension Lama. After he was released from prison after the death of Mao Zedong, when Deng Xiaoping took up the responsibility in China, there was little space for freedom in the early 80s when Hu Yaobang also sent his people to study the situation inside Tibet. And Benjamin Rinpoche played a very, very important role in getting Tibetan language back on the Tibetan landscape, Tibetan religion back on the Tibetan landscape. But unfortunately, he died very young. In fact, we have every reason to believe that the former Benjamin Rinpoche was assassinated if we look at the telltale signs on his body, we could see a lot of signs of poisoning. He was doing very well. He was speaking upright about what has happened inside Tibet. And in a few days, he was no more with us. But there was no post-mortem done. <clears throat> so there's no proof that he was assassinated. But I met people who attended to him, and they claimed that there were a lot of telltale signs that he was assassinated. And six years later, Chinese government formed a search committee led by Chaitanya Rinpoche. And the search committee informed His Holiness the Dalai Lama about potential candidates. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama, through proper Buddhist rituals, selected Gendu Chui and now officially known as Chesun Tenzin Gendu Yishi Chilen Kuzo Pesambo in 1996, soon after His Holiness recognized Genichu Nima as the reincarnation of the 10th Pension Lama, he was abducted by the Chinese government along with his father, uh, along with his family. Now nobody knows where he is. We don't even know whether he's alive or not. There has been a lot of representation from the international community, including the United Nations, about his whereabouts. And Jamel now also referred to the response that came out from China that he's studying, he doesn't want to be disturbed. And now we don't know, even if he's alive, whether he's been trained to take on the responsibilities that he's traditionally used to. And I said in the United States, in one of my talks there, I said China made a tactical mistake but not, by not recognizing the same boy that His Holiness recognized. Because China, from the Chinese perspective, they think that the Pension Lama has a role to play in the selection of the Dalai Lama, which need not necessarily be in that particular framework. But then, if they had kept the same, Dalai, same Pension Lama recognized by His Holiness, today it could be a tool in their hand. But instead, they selected their own Pension Lama through a dubious means through the golden urn, as they say, but it was manipulated. You can read that in another book by Ajay Rinpoche, who was a witness to the process of the selection by the Chinese government. And today, Chinese selected Pension Lama is just another leader for the Tibetans inside Tibet. He's not recognized as a Pension Lama by Tibetans inside Tibet. 
You have no access to Tibet except for those journalists and diplomats that are invited by China from friendly nations. But then if you do have access, you will realize that the Tibetans inside Tibet, to show their displeasure, do not sell pictures of Chinese selected pension lama on the streets of Lhasa. They can't sell the pictures of the 11th pension lama recognized by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So they sell only the pictures of the 10th pension lama. And Chinese government, instead of keeping the, their own pension lama with a traditional seat in Tashikumbo, they kept him in Beijing and they periodically sent him to Tibet just to show the world that there is respect from the Tibetan community for the Chinese pension lama. And this year, May, again, he went from Kham to Lhasa, or Shigase. But they, they had to pay money to receive the pension lama, 200 yuan to receive the pension lama. And they pay money to listen to pension lama, just to show that they, the Tibetans respect pension lama. They tried to send him to Thailand. They did send him to Hong Kong on, on, a, on visits, but very low-key visits. There were also news about the Chinese government wanting to send pension lama, Chinese pension lama to Nepal. We did find out. We did inform the right authorities at that time, and the planned visit could not happen. Now what else they could do? Maybe they send them, sent him to Mongolia, where Mongolians don't respect him. You know, so that is why the abduction of Pension Lama is directly related with the reincarnation of the 15th Dalai Lama. China is not concerned about the living 14th. They are more concerned about the yet to come 15th Dalai Lama because they know that if they can control the 15th Dalai Lama, they can control the people of Tibet. But my message to the Chinese government is, have you not learned enough lesson from the Pension Lama saga where the Tibetans don't recognize the Chinese selected Pension Lama? It will be the same with His Holiness. In the latest white paper that Chinese came out, China said that we will look for Dalai Lama's reincarnation in Tibet. Now how do they know that the Dalai Lama will be born in Tibet? <laughs> the fourth Dalai Lama was born in Mongolia. And Angela also referred to the sixth Dalai Lama being born in Tawang. So there have been two Dalai Lamas who were born outside Tibet. His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the 14th Dalai Lama, has been very, very categorical in his statements that he will be born only in a free world. So if Tibet is not free at the time of such an eventuality, then His Holiness will not be born in Tibet. So search for His Holiness inside Tibet would be a futile exercise. So I also tell the Chinese government, do you need a lifelong headache or not? Because if you have two Dalai Lamas, it's going to be a lifelong problem. Problem. His Holiness keeps assuring us that he will be living. He will live for another two decades or more. His Holiness keeps assuring us that keeps assuring us that he will live up to 113 years of age. And there were propitious pre-signs that this Dalai Lama would live very long. And we believe in His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And I personally believe that this message is more for the Chinese leadership because the Chinese leadership is waiting for this Dalai Lama to die. And their calculation is that he will not live more than 96. You know, so under such circumstances, they want to interfere in the process of the selection. It's His Holiness who's going to be reborn. And this reincarnation is very unique to Tibetan Buddhism. I mean, there are many Buddhist countries in this world, but it's not there in other countries. So the one who is going to be reborn has the right to decide where he or she will be born. And it's His Holiness and His Holiness alone who will be deciding about the process and where he will be born. And His Holiness has been also very categorical since 1969 that whether there should be a 15 Dalai Lama or not will be decided by the Tibetan people. But now the followers of His Holiness extends beyond Tibet to the Indian Himalayas, in Bhutan and in Nepal, to Mongolia, to the Russian republics of Kalmykia, Buryat and Tuva. Now you have so many disciples coming from across Buddhist countries in East Asia and Southeast Asia, from Japan to South Korea to Vietnam, to Thailand, Laos, Singapore, and many countries. And His Holiness disciples now even extend to the Western countries. 
So the only one document that concerns His Holiness reincarnation is the September 2011 document, wherein His Holiness says that he will consult and take some decisions when he reaches the age of 90. And this July 6th, we celebrated His Holiness 88th birth anniversary. <clears throat> and it's another one and a half year down the line. Some governments tell me, oh, you don't seem to have a process in place, or His Holiness have not decided about his reincarnation. It could be an emanation, it could be a reincarnation. Sometimes His Holiness says that this could be the last Dalai Lama. When asked, His Holiness also said it could be a female Dalai Lama. And when I travel around the world, some people ask me, you don't seem to have a process in place. I said, that's your perspective. But our friends in India who understand China, and the Tibetans think that the decision taken by His Holiness the Dalai Lama right now is very wise because China cannot handle unpredictability. I was in Thailand once reading local newspaper because they were not able to predict what Trump is going to do. So they go to oracles to decide, to ask the oracles what President Trump is going to do. You know, if His Holiness decides now as to what exactly or when exactly all these things will happen, China has all the mechanisms, both financial and human resources, to spread their propaganda around the world. And that is why when His Holiness does not decide, they, they, they don't know what to do. You know, because some words, some final words have to come from His Holiness. And we pray that the Pension Lama is alive and Chinese government come out clearly with this message as to where he is and what he is doing. Our people deserve to know how opaque can Chinese government be in these matters. Um, and particularly in India, we know we are very shy of talking about China. But one thing that having lived with China for so many centuries, one thing that we know is unless you stand up for your values and for your positions, China will never ever respect you. Europeans tell me, oh, the dragon is biting at us. Then I tell them, who fed the dragon to make it so powerful to be able to bite at you? It's Americans, it's Europe, it's Japan, including Taiwan, that made China what it is today. For Americans, I tell them, you don't have to read too many books. Henry Kissinger died very recently. You just read one book, Kissinger on China. It will tell you. When China was about to fall, U.S. was the one to support China, to exist in the manner they existed today. Now, knowing that China is biting at you, if you still want to feed the dragon, whose fault is it? So you have the EU-China summit coming up in the next few days. Uh, the whole focus is on the economy. They need European market. They need Southeast Asian market. But on the other hand, politically, they align with all the rogues, all the uh, gundas in this world. Yeah. So China is playing this dual game because of its belligerence on the Indian border, bellicosity towards Taiwan, and hegemonic ambitions in the region, including South China Sea. They keep these hotspots burning. And when this is a real threat to the survival of the Communist Party, then they will take some action. That is how <clears throat> I understand the situation. Otherwise, nothing grows on the land that they are fighting at, on the LOC, in Ladakh. We were there. Our friends are here from Ladakh. They know how the landscape looks like, the salami slicing of India. But that is more. And they are pushing India towards the West and with the free world. And we are very happy that today, India has taken a more stronger position that unless there's disengagement from all sectors, there won't be normalization of relationships. So that is how it should be, because China has been trying to contain India for too long with its all-weather friendship with Pakistan. Very flowery language, higher than the skies, deeper than the ocean, sweeter than the honey relationship with Pakistan. And it's all aimed towards containing India. So I thank again Sikhib Mabuche for his leadership as the abbot of Tashnambu Monastery, that's the traditional seat of the Bajan Lamas, traveling around the world, telling the world about 
finding out about what happened to Benjamin Lama. Uh, we deserve to know. And this is a very simple information that the Chinese government need to divulge. They cannot keep it hiding for that long. So thank you very much for your attention and for your time, and I'm very glad to be part of this discourse. And we'll keep pushing for Benjamin Mitchell's release along with all other political prisoners that are being incarcerated for Tibet just because they are a little more popular than others. If you are, whether you are an environmental activist or activist or a language activist or a religious leader, or when you gain little fame in Tibet, then it's a threat to the Communist Party. Yeah, so that should stop. Uh, we hope that better sense will prevail on the leaders of China. I also jokingly tell countries that if you have good brain surgeons, we'll, drink, we'll bring the Chinese leader one by one, do brain surgery on them, put some common sense in, in them and send them back to China because we have addressed their main concern, sovereignty. But unfortunately, they are still not being realistic. And I think the Indians also need to understand China better. It's not like old times. There has to be more awareness on what China is doing and its motivations around the world. Only then can we be more vigilant. Only then can we be able to take more pragmatic policies in regards to China. I have been asking the Europeans, we need more transatlantic cooperation when it comes to China. Please don't look at us as victims of communism, Chinese communism. If you want to bring about positive change in China, we are the internal forces. You need both internal forces and external forces. Tibetans are the internal forces. Uyghurs are the internal forces. The Mongols are so also the Hong Kongers and Taiwanese in that sense. So if we have to bring about positive change in China, please look at us as partners, not just victims then we can also play a positive role in framing your China strategy and Indochina policy. Thank you very much. Now I would like to invite His Eminence, Sikha Rinpoche, Abbot of Tashmubu Monarch.